Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at something a little special, a little unique. It wasn't so unique a couple of years ago, but things have changed in the optics world. If you have, if you, if you've been living under a rock, the rise of variable-powered optics has really taken hold in the marketplace. And things like this, this fixed power 10x that we're about to take a look at, has really gone the way of the dinosaur in most cases. It was that back in the day, you wanted to fix power because they were really strong, really reliable, and could really take a beating. They also typically had pretty good glass because there was less going on. But as much as I'm willing to see how well this optic works, I'm also here to answer a question. And that question is going to be, are fixed powered optics like this still a viable thing to purchase in today's market? So without further ado, let's crack this box open and see what we've got. For many of you that are unfamiliar with my channel over the last couple of years, I'm a big fan of fixed powered optics. Things like this fixed 10X side focus SWFA has been in my arsenal for a very long time. I have my 16X, that's my go-to optic for testing mounts down in the garage. I had a 12X, I had a 20X, and I have another 10X that's on my 452. That's more of like my M24, like homage little rimfire. This, however, has been a unicorn for me. Not this particular USO in, in, in question. No, it was actually the model before this, year, which was when they moved from California to, I believe, Montana. They produced this. Now they're in North Carolina. Now it's the Foundation Series. They still make a fixed 10X, and you can buy them brand new, just like this, with a couple of key differences as far as all the controls go. But they're around $1,600. That's a lot of money, I know. But keep in mind, this is an American-made optic. Now, granted, is this better than their FX10 when they were in California or their new Foundation Series 10X? I don't know. I don't have all three of them here to compare against. But this should still give us a solid representation of how well the optic actually performs. Anywho, I'm going to pull this out. I'm going to change my camera settings a little bit so I don't blind you as we flip through this real quick. Um, but there's isn't a whole lot to really talk about on this. It has locking turrets, it's got push button illumination, which I'm not the biggest fan of. It's got, uh, that's about it. It's got a zero stop. It's got locking turrets, I said that. That's basically it. All right, enough of that. Let's get back to the optic at hand. Fix 10X, you might wonder what the hell I'm doing with this. I just have a, f a fascination with fix 10Xs. I don't know why. Maybe because back in the 90s, militaries were still using these very efficiently and effectively. And I just like the idea of having a fixed 10x. I, 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 can't, I can't explain it more than that. It's just something that it excites me. Weight on this thing, despite the fact we have AED scope caps on this, feels a little on the chunky side. 28.4 ounces is a little on the heavier side, considering that it's basically just a fixed 10x. The SWFA with rings and a bubble level is still an ounce lighter. And just for comparison's sake, an optic that's about the same-ish price, if not a couple hundred dollars less, is made in Japan and very, very good, comes in about eight ounces lighter. This, of course, being the Razer LHT from Vortex. But I really want to check out the build quality in this American-made optic. I took off the AED scope caps because they don't really come with this brand new. I did buy this secondhand for about 900 bucks. Which is a lot of money. Yeah, I know. But I needed to know if I was going to like this as much as I should or not. And we'll, we'll touch on this more throughout the entire video. Anyway, fast focus eyepiece at the back is knurled with very aggressive knurling. Good feel all the way out. Quarter turn in. That is fucking rock solid. This feels like I can drop it on here. And it's not going to gain any sort of wiggle. That is quite impressive, believe you me. Good resistance, hard to turn, so that knurling really does come in handy to get it exactly where you want it, but that is very, very good. On to the magnification. Oh, that's right, it's a fixed 10X, silly. So, onwards to the illumination control, which is a push button. I do not like this push button setup at all, because you have to push it on and then cycle through all of its brightness settings, to which I think there's eight or 10, till it goes off. And then you have to turn it back on. There is no press and hold. There is no memory function on this. It's just simply push, 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 push. Okay, that's the brightness I want. And if you go accidentally too far, guess what? You start from scratch again. So it's a bit of a pain in the butt. There is no way 
of grabbing onto the battery compartment housing easily. This is a very smooth surface, but the reason why they did that is this way when you go to adjust your side focus, you don't accidentally twist the battery compartment and remove it and have the illumination crap out on you. You have two little dots on the inside, two little leads. You have a standard CR2032 with two guide pins to line it up and our two leads coming off of the battery compartment. Battery should come out of this fairly easily. And that's it. There isn't a whole lot to this. It's not the most glamorous, but it seems to work so far. We do have pretty good contact over here against the positive part of the battery. And the negative is that hard pin right there kind of reminiscent of a Kala's K16 or K18i, but you know what? It seems like the more money you spend on optics, sometimes the less the quality seems to be on certain components like this. Now, the reason why I don't like this is now we really have to be careful of lining this up. I should note that the threads are internal on this and they're external on the battery compartment housing. So it's a little tricky to get in there. You can see, of course, that the Side focus spins independently of the button control. So the best way I've found to line this up is to actually remove the button and the battery itself. Line this up, which as you can see is a bit of a nuisance, like so. Then slide this over the outside without dislodging it, and then turn that down. It's a real pain in the butt. From there, we're gonna check out the side focus, which goes from, I believe it's like 25 yards, to 100 yards to infinity and it's almost a full sweep so this should give us a really good finite ability to adjust this properly to whatever distance we're shooting at very smooth well damped and the grooves on this seem to be pretty good as far as traction is concerned i would have liked to see this knurling over here as well but not everything can be a plxc now, before we start talking about the turrets themselves, this is the tool to reset it. You got to come over here, lock it first, and then loosen this up to then reset your zero on this. I'm not going to get too much into detail because that stuff isn't going to be so exciting, but it is not a very elegant system. In fact, it's quite frustrating, but guess what? It is what it is. Moving on to the turrets. We have this collar down here, which you might never have seen before. This is actually your lock collar. Pull this down to then twist the turret. Ten mils per rotation is pretty fantastic and should be the normal on basically every turret. I don't know why they would do odd numbers like six or eight or seven, five or 10 and nothing else, but 10 should always be the, the default. If you can't guess, these turrets are among the best I've ever felt. And I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. They sound quite amazing and they should because under this cap are three ball bearings that interlock with the detents inside. I'm not gonna pull this off, but I will roll in a picture. I don't know if it's broken or if it's designed like that from the factory, but if you were to remove this cap all the way, this little ball bearing is gonna shoot out and get lost on you, and you're gonna be in your hands and knees looking for it. Fortunately, I was able to find it. Fortunately, I was able to get the erector back together. Design flaw? I don't know. I just didn't particularly care for it because I nearly destroyed this optic before I even had the chance to really use it. However, if I did destroy this optic, I know from experience with working with USO for my MR10 1.8 to 10, that they will probably gladly fix this thing for free, no questions asked, just like they did with that. Locking the elevation, we're gonna move on to the windage, and you can clearly see this is a more typical locking turret left and right, not as sharp of a click. When you're going slow, but when you go fast, feels excellent, seven, eight, nine, 10 mils. I'm not even gonna worry about stretching this out any further than that. Feels really good, a little bit of play. The, el the elevation had no play. It is a little hard though to line up that arrow with the perfect line when it's open, unlocked. But once you get it locked in there, it's not gonna go anywhere. 
So before we get behind this thing, one of the reasons why I wanted this is just because it's simple. It's easy. And when it's paired, hold on, there it is, with something like this, a spur mount, I can put an offset red dot on this and have a 1x and a 10x. And that's it. Put this on a more precision focused build or a more practical precision focused build like I really get a hard on for. And I can have something that's efficient from point blank with an offset red dot to about a thousand yards on a man sized target. And guess what? I'm not shooting over 308 as of currently right now. So this has the potential to be a wildly functional setup. And that's the whole reason why I wanted to try one of these things. I know that variable powered optics are all the rage and they're fucking great. Even something as inexpensive as the Swamp Fox Kentucky Long 2 to 12, for example, has a lot more going for it already than this $1,600 USO. Why not just run your $400 SWFA that you've already got on your shelf collecting dust that you took off a of Precision 223 build you did a long time ago? I've already done that. It's time to try something different. And I want you to come along for the ride. So without further ado, let's finally get behind this thing and see if this fixed 10 X is actually worth it. I have been waiting for one of these for an extremely long time. This being the BFX 10 is discontinued. They've replaced it with the FX 10, which is part of their new foundation series, which takes them back to their original roots of being really high end, more or less customized optics. As a result, with the new models, not this particular one, you can get it with four different styles of reticles. The Gap, both in MOA and MIL, the JNG MIL, the MOA Scale Type 1, and the H425. You can also get it in a plethora of different customized options as far as what sort of turrets you want, whether you want them specifically set up for a cartridge, custom CDSs similar to what Loophole does. You give them your ballistics, and then they shit you out a turret, and boom, you're done. Or standard turret like what we have here with the mill. You might see me fumbling around on the left-hand side. That is because the illumination did not want to work at this particular moment in time, and it was giving me some trouble. I deduced that I believe the pins just weren't lining up 100%. It's since sort of rectified itself, and it's been working perfectly fine since. As far as what reticle we have, this is the mill gap reticle, which I really, really like. It's simple, it's clean, it's very legible, and is very easy to pick up. The video doesn't do these turrets justice. They sound and feel truly incredible. And that lock collar is part of the reason. I haven't seen a lock collar like this on any other turret. This is unique to this. As far as I am aware, I could be wrong. And if you didn't realize, that center screw is actually the erector itself. And it does come up as you rotate up and acts as a rotational indicator. Adjusting the side focus, you can see we are just at the bottom end of the magnification scale. Literally, we are at the bottom right there. But bringing it up, the image does not shift all that much, which is pretty impressive. There's some other optics that will shift wildly. The illumination control, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's as bright as it'll get, and that is it. Unlocking the elevation and the windage turrets, let's give this thing a go. That is beautiful. I forgot to mention that the reticle is slightly favoring the right hand side of our windage line. So that is basically perfect. Reset that to zero, which is right there. Lock that in place and let's just keep on climbing. One, two, three, four, five, and six. That is 10 perfect mills. These turrets feel incredible. They're probably some of my favorite turrets besides the ZCO. The ZCO had a little bit more bite to it, but these just have such a, a good feel, good sound, and the locking on them on the ring is brilliant. Reset, absolutely perfect. 
no discrepancies, which is exactly what I was hoping for. That, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the best tracking performances I've ever accomplished on this channel, and it should be for the price. $2,000 for a BFX10 is what they're basically going for right now. You might be able to find them a little bit cheaper, but that's a lot of coin, and it damn well better perform incredibly perfect if you were to spend that much money on any sort of optic. But going from a positive into a bit of a moot point, more neutral, is the iBox. This being a fixed 10x, you might expect it to be a little bit better than what you might find on, let's say, any other magnified optic that has a 10x, with the exception of like a 1 to 10. Let's say you have a 3 to 15, a 5 to 25. Usually when you get behind a 10x in those sort of magnified optics, the 10x is still typically pretty forgiving. Here, it's a little bit tighter than I was kind of hoping for. I was in the mindset of there's less moving parts, there's less glass inside, it's a 34mm tube, it is a 42mm front of objective, which might have something to do with it, and it is pretty compact, but I was hoping that the eye box would be a little bit more forgiving on this. It's about on par with what you'd see in like a 3 to 15 when you put it to 10x. So if you have one of those, you set it to 10x, that's about what you get, give or take, a little bit. It's really hard to put an actual number on this, I don't have any scientific equipment other than just a finely calibrated eyeball, but I find this to be at best as good as some high quality 3 to 15 set at 10x, which is acceptable, but I was hoping for a little bit more to be brutally honest. From a bit of a neutral point to another set of positives. The first thing is going to be the overall brightness through this thing. Despite the fact it's only a 42 millimeter front objective, there is less glass inside of it, which means that the light that is coming through it is being transmitted out the rear eyepiece at a much higher intensity because there's less lenses in the way to just diminish the amount of light. That kind of makes sense. And it really does show. The overall sharpness and clarity also shows tremendously. The colors I find to be a little bit more on the neutral side, a little bit more muted. But I did film and test this primarily during the winter, so I didn't get the chance to get any sort of vibrant greens and yellows and oranges. Well, I mean, we got oranges, but it's all dead leaf kind of oranges, which is not appealing to anyone. Because this is strictly a 10x scope, this is all you have. It does offer a very nice field of view, but the view looking through it is another one of those things that has to be mentioned. It is monstrous simply gargantuan and it really does make the experience of getting behind it really really rewarding and with that let's get into some side-by-side -side comparisons against some other unlikely scopes well actually the first one's gonna be pretty likely it's the swfa fixed 10x this is the side focus version which you guys haven't really seen but it's the exact same as the rear focus version just with a side focus as opposed to the focus being at the rear these are about 400 bucks, but you can get the rear focus ones for around 300 and they are really, really nice for the money. Some of you might even be looking at these two right now and going, I might even prefer the SWFA. And you know what? More power to you. It's, you know, a seventh of the price of what we can get a BFX10 or an FX10 for, and that's a, a considerable savings. But it doesn't have anywhere near the same sort of overall build quality and controls as the USO but it does perform the same similar task. You have a fixed 10X. But the view looking through the USO is much, much larger. In fact, the image just looks so much larger looking through the USO that it just adds this another dimension to it that makes the entire experience, like I already said, really, really special. But the SWFA is definitely something that if you want to try out a fixed 10X and you don't want to spend $2,000 or try to find something used, you go with one of those because they're 300 bucks. You can get them on sale when they run their sales for like 220, 230. It's an absolute no brainer if you want to see if the system even works for you. And we're going to definitely touch on like, you know, the point of use and the concept behind running a fixed 10X. But what happens if you're like, I got a 3 to 15 or a 3 to 18, like with this Miopta Optica 6, and I'm just going to run that at 10X? Well, this is what it's going to look like. The Miopta is one of those jack of all trade scopes. It's something I constantly come back to because it performs everything very, very, very well. It's not perfect in one regard, but it does everything really, really good. And that's why, to me, it is the king of 3 to 18s as of right now. That might change, but for the 8 ish $100 that you can find them for, 
they're supposedly made in the U.S. with U.S. components and I believe European glass, but I could be mistaken because there's no real like guaranteed concrete information for the Optica 6 series, but it served me extremely well. And if you do want to run something like that at 10x like what we have here, even though my point of aim is a little bit off, you can see that the field of view or the view that we could see to the right part of the image, which is what I'm trying to accentuate here, it's almost the same. So it just goes to show you that one of the weaknesses of the Optica 6 is it's a, got a fairly narrow field of view, but also, again, the view looking through it is substantially smaller than with the USO. So is that the only reason why you buy the USO? Because it's got a really large view looking through it and a decent field of view? Hardly the case. We're going to touch on that again towards the end of the video, but for right now, as a side-by-side -side comparison, that's what you could expect between this and something else. I had filmed this last winter, and as a result of that, the exterior air, which is much colder than the interior air of my apartment, created a little bit of mirage when the windows open to give you as clear a view possible of whatever we're looking at. But as a result, you get some mirage, which here at 900 yards, you can very clearly see. But when we push past a little bit farther at 1,000 yards, which is what we're going to look at right now, it does become a little bit more apparent. In fact, significantly more apparent. In fact, it became so much more apparent that it sort of defeats the purpose of even trying this. So I filmed another variant of this, but on a slightly different sort of condition. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, you haven't seen much snow on this channel, so I figured, why the hell not? It also benefits us because, guess what, the air was actually extremely still that day, and there was very little to no mirage. So, it's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. Plus, it allows us to see how well this scope can perform through snow at a thousand yard target. And guess what? The illumination worked this day. So it's a triple win for everybody as far as I'm concerned. The illumination on full is one of the brightest you'll ever see on an MPVO. Now you might ask yourself a question, and I actually asked myself this question as well. If it's a fixed power scope, can the illumination technically be on the second focal plane and you could have like a fiber dot on it? I would have to say yes, but this is not the case. I believe this is on a first focal plane illuminated reticle, like it would be on any other first focal plane scope, with the exception of the dual emitter stuff. But here, the illumination proves that it is incredibly bright. Definitely one of the brightest you'll ever see on an MPVO, bar none. And it's very even. It's very neat. Look at it. It's gorgeous. As far as how the image looks, now that we've added 10 mils of elevation, you see I had to adjust my camera setting a little bit. It's about a sixteenth of an inch off, so the eye box does shift, or rather the exit pupil does shift. But once we compensate for that, we have a tremendously good-looking image. But I'm not going to stop there, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, there is still more elevation to get out of this erector. So we're going to turn it up to about 19 full mils of elevation. Let's see if that wreaks any sort of havoc on the image quality. Again, you can see the image gets a little bit darker from the exit pupil shifting, but compensating for that, which is a very minor amount, so minute that it's really hard for me to try to compensate for. Once we do, however, the image doesn't look any worse than what it did when we started out. In fact, I might say it even looks a little bit better, a little bit sharper in the edges, but I'll let you decide that. As for me, this is an excellent performance. From very clearly a pro to another bit of a neutral point, I want to see what kind of ambient light this thing can gather when it's, you know, mid to late evening, as you see here. We're focusing our attention on a 400-yard brick building. That is pretty dark, but it's still very easy to spot with the naked eye. So we're going to throw the scope in front of it as soon as you get a really good picture of what that house looks like, what that brick building looks like. You got it? You got it? Okay, good. As you can see, with the scope in place, the image is a little bit darker than what we saw without it. This thing doesn't let in as much light as I would like. It's still very usable, don't get me wrong, but I really wish they went with a larger front objective to help gather in more light. You would think, and this is the way I would think, it's a fixed power, there's less lenses inside, it should let in more light. And during the day, that's very true, but the front objective is very limiting on this scope when it gets a little bit darker. Plus, the fact that it's a fixed 10x means that you can't make it any brighter by decreasing your magnification, which is yet another limitation to running a fixed power scope as opposed to a variable. 
However, again, that illumination is gorgeous and gets way too bright here on its brightest setting. Just look at how beautiful that looks, though. It's like a warm glow of embers in a fire pit. Wonderful. One final comparison between the USO and the Miyata Optica 6 before we get into my final thoughts. These were filmed on the same day, but cloud coverage came in hot and heavy, and thus why the color tones between these two look so drastically different. With the USO, you can clearly tell that we had a very bright sunny day, whereas with the Miyata Optica 6, those clouds came in with a vengeance. I did change the camera settings for the Miyata Optica 6 video to try to bring it a little bit closer to what was with the USO, but for right now, let's look at the views looking through these things. Not only is the USO substantially larger with just how gargantuan the image is, but also look at the target. The target does look significantly larger with the USO as opposed to the O6, but that could just be because, guess what? It is a variable powered scope and maybe it wasn't tuned properly. But that's neither here nor there. There's no real way for me to test that. As far as our overall field of view, both of these are set for the exact same zero on the exact same target. And we see basically the exact same amount of target to the right. So as near as makes no difference, they are the same. Image quality on both of these is very good. But again, getting behind the USO is part of an experience that transcends its limitations of only being a 10x. And I think that is the perfect segue into my final thoughts for this BFX-10 from US Optics. This video was longer than it had any right of being. There isn't a whole lot to really talk about with a fixed power scope. Just watch any of my PRISM videos. They're usually in like the low to mid 20s because after you do an unboxing or a physical overview, what else is there to really talk about other than its image quality and illumination and reticle design? But with this US Optics BFX-10, it's a little bit more in depth than that. At least it is for me. You see, personal preference is one of those things where you just get excited for something. As you just saw my hand do the what the fuck, that is because the illumination wasn't working this day. Which for me has absolutely been the biggest negative of the scope so far. If you didn't watch the unboxing or you skipped past it, the way the illumination housing works is the battery and the button are on this little cap that gets screwed into the parallax knob, but it doesn't spin with the parallax knob. So as you adjust the parallax knob like I just did, there's an O-ring inside there that creates a seal. And in my findings, when you adjust it a lot, sometimes that cap spins. And because that cap for the battery compartment doesn't have any sort of knurling on it or, or, or anything to grab it, it's just smooth, you sometimes don't get it as tight as it needs to be. Again, in my findings on this scope, this is a serving size of one, you might experience something different. But for me, that's why I was having battery problems. It really isn't the best design. And I really hope USO changes that for their future models. As far as what I found to be another negative, I would like to see this with a larger front objective to gathering a little bit more light. During the day, it seems perfectly fine, but at night, it does get a little bit darker than I would like. But again, this is a fixed 10x, so there is some stuff that's going to be given up on this thing. If that just so happens to be another one of those, then that's just unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Now, I'm not going to say that this thing being a fixed 10x is a negative. In fact, that is going to be a positive because there's a company that still makes a fixed 10x. If you don't want to fix 10x, don't buy this scope. You can buy so many other variable powered scopes and set it to 10x. That's not why you buy this. You buy this thing because it's a 10x. So that's a pro in my opinion. As far as the other cons, all the controls are honestly perfect. I wouldn't touch anything. Elevation, windage, ocular adjustment. Even the parallax is perfect. The only thing that I would change externally is absolutely the, the the push button for the illumination. I'd at least make it rotate with the parallax knob. I'm sure they did it so this way there's there's fewer means of egress of water and contaminants, but it just doesn't seem to work well here in my findings. The rest of the scope, in my opinion, is a pro. It is a little bit on the heavy side, but that's because it's built out of really good materials and it's really thick. You can feel it in the tube that it's got a lot more mass there than what you might find on other scopes that let's say are variable power. Because again, this thing is designed to be as tough and as durable as possible. Again, why it's only a fixed 10x. So when you think of this thing as being another scope, 
for two thousand dollars you might go ah well i could buy other scopes that do more things absolutely right you you can but that is not what the scope is this is designed to be as tough and as robust and as simple as possible and i have no doubt that this thing could literally drive nails if you took it off and used it as a hammer I have no doubt that you could drop this thing out of a helicopter and it'd probably be okay as long as it didn't land on concrete. I know that because I've watched videos on that with USO's older models and they just work. You buy this because you want something that will hopefully be as durable as granite. And guess what? If it isn't, USO's warranty is phenomenal. Their customer service is excellent. I have had nothing but great experiences with them in the past and i hope i never have to deal with them again because you buy a product that you want to last but if something does happen guess what they got your back and then some this video is really long because i did have a lot to say and truth be told most of it's really good the view through this thing and just the overall experience of getting behind it is truly that it's an experience and if you're looking for a fixed 10x whether you want to run it by itself or with an offset red dot, this is probably as good as you're going to get, but you're going to pay for it. However, you're getting something that really is truly unique in the segment because how many fixed 10 X's are there out there and how many of them can you say are as tough and as robust as this? Yes, there is the SWFA HD 10 X. I don't think that's a fair comparison. Because that's about half the price of one of these, but doesn't come with illumination, doesn't have a 34mm main tube, and doesn't have locking turrets. The, there's a lot more that this scope offers as opposed to that. And the fact that this is still made in America, god damn it, that just makes me proud. So with that, a huge thank you to all of you for making this video possible. Because I used funds from my Patreon providers to help pay for this. Most of it did come out of my pocket. And... Can I say that this thing lives up to the dream? It lives up to the hype that I have built around the USO Fix 10X? Yes. Yes, it does. But I haven't really run this through its paces. I have shot with this thing a fair amount, but not to the point where I could say definitively that this is what I was looking for this entire time. It may or may not serve a a purpose and if it does great it will be kept if not it will go on to the next lad and hopefully make their dreams come true as well so with that a huge thank you to all of you for watching and as always see you again next time and a huge thank you to my patreon providers and my subscribe star subscribers without you this truly wouldn't be possible if you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those i completely understand but you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below and or like share and subscribe as always Again, thank you very much.